Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Automate the Transition to Value-Based Care with Self-Service Analytics, Practical Perspective from Industry Experts. This is Mackenzie, Mackenzie Bean, Managing Editor at Becker's Hospital Review. And on behalf of Becker's, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation, and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. If at any time you don't see your slides moving or you have trouble with the audio, please try refreshing your browser as that might help. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box as we are also here to help you. With that, I am so pleased to welcome today's speaker. Nathan Patrick Taylor is the Chief Information Officer at Symphony Care Network, and Dennis Dzinski is the Regional Vice President at Alltrex. Nathan and Dennis, thank you so much for being here today. Really excited for this presentation. Um, and with that, Dennis, I'll turn the floor over to you to get things started. Thank you, Mackenzie. Appreciate it. <clears throat> and good afternoon and good morning to everyone. I'd like to start today by talking about why organizations like yours that are looking to become more data driven, a uh, more data driven culture, uh, and talk about how the analytic process automation or APA from Altrix is part of that journey. So let's define the data driven culture and talk about the kinds of returns we see from these strategies. Businesses that are data-driven are 77% more likely to significantly exceed their business goals. And according to a McKenzie study, they're also 19 times more likely to be profitable. Data-driven businesses don't just do traditional BI in their decision-making. Instead, they build end-to-end -end scalable analytic business models that automate process and take prescriptive action to deliver faster business outcomes. With this as a foundation, it's no surprise that data-driven businesses create a competitive advantage by acting smarter and faster than the competition. And according to McKinsey, data-driven businesses are six times more likely to retain existing customers and 23% more times more likely to acquire new customers over the competition. And with automation at the heart of the successful transformation, it's no surprise to see data-driven firms and huge job satisfaction ratings from the employees. Um, and this is an opportunity to really, truly level up the employees and get out of those mundane, repetitive daily tasks and use your talents to grow and develop your business and create higher levels of profitability. So with APA, there's a, a key component to alignment. First, it's the means by which we automate the many levels of process within the organization. Everything from simple data acquisition and transformation to enriching and anal analyzing and delivering actionable insights. By freeing up significant resources that were trapped in the processes, we get to redeploy domain specialists to focus on new, innovative, and high value work. That's the spark for culture, a culture of change and to build a digital ready workforce. And finally, none of this would be possible with trans, without transformative thinking about the data itself. We go into the process with the hard won understanding that technology doesn't deliver value in the change of, of process alone. It's the data that provides the actionable insights in your high performing analytics culture. And that is our platform advantage. Being able to align these core competence, uh, components of any digital transformation program within our unified analytics, data science and process automation platform leads to faster and more successful business outcomes. So when we look at the APA platform from Alteryx, I mean, this slide looks fairly technical in nature, but the reality is this is work that is achieved and, and done by the analyst community, by the frontline workers. Analytic process automation is unified analytics, data science and process automation all in one platform. 
APA solves the challenges of automating the inputs from your sources to the left, everything from traditional data platforms, local files, applications, and uh, to more modern and diverse sources, such as process automation bots, data in the cloud, and external business process logic. And it unifies all of the analytic steps by providing users with over 270 automation building blocks, covering the full spectrum of the analytics lifecycle. And because of the tight integration of the components in the APA platform, you can start to solve from any point and progress from there. Starting with the data prep and profiling, building a repeatable approach to acquiring data across your enterprise and beyond, but ensuring that your workforce can add their own domain expertise as they explore and profile the data, dealing with anomalies and standardizing common fields while applying calculations or transformations in a consistent and repeatable way. When we look at data blending, data blending is there to ensure consistency from across your data sources, particularly when it comes to matching customer data, patient information, business or transactional data, provider information, in order to unlock the value of those sources. With diagnostic reporting, we ensure that data can be described and distributed in a simple and flexible way to help improve the unified process by getting those insights into the hands of the colleagues that need that information. As an organization develops its APA vision, we offer geospatial analytics as well as other forms of location. So if you think about initiatives where you may be identifying the next clinic or hospital that you would build or acquire, these are opportunities to take advantage of APA in order to help you make more insightful decisions. Customers frequently look to add data science capabilities to supplement their decision making. And with the Altrix APA platform, this allows customers to develop sophisticated data science models that are code free or code friendly. So if you have individuals who understand how to write code, they can still work within the Altrix environment. But for those users that are not code savvy and don't have the technical background, they can still work within the same environment as those that do. The capabilities extend an organization's reach in being able to find patterns and behaviors deep within their data and their processes. But open this up to a modern digital workforce using AI and ML by delivering powerful yet explainable results through the unified platform. And when most vendors in this space are focused on code first rather than code free, these building blocks offer a real competitive edge to companies that are prioritizing workforce engagement and upskilling. And the upskilling component is extremely important to everyone who's on the phone and understanding that, you know, this is a technology that has enabled individuals to be able to take their careers to the next level, as well as improve their work-life balance because they've eliminated mundane routines and activities that could be done using automation. This slide is a bit of an eye chart, but the reason that I bring this up is just to demonstrate that when using the APA platform from Altrix, there's an opportunity for organizations to continue to grow and expand on their successes as they continue to build out the uh, data-driven culture within the organization. So while you may start out, for example, in a finance-related use case, maybe with audit and tax, you build on that success. And once you've achieved some success within a, a single use case, the way Altrix typically grows within an organization is that you'll continue to develop additional use cases, perhaps within that department, but also recognizing that that growth could expand out to other departments of your business. Any area of the organization that re relies on data to make decisions or is looking to rely more on data uh, has an opportunity to take advantage of the Altrix platform and be able to automate that process in order to create additional agility and efficiencies. So I won't go through each and every one of these use cases, but I think what you'll see here is that most of these will relate to your own organizations and things that you've been trying to solve or have been working through. Um, and these are use cases that we have actually worked through with customers and with our partners in order to enable those organizations to have great success there. 
And on this slide here, what we're showing is that that success comes in a variety of values. And it could be as simple as uh, a few users just using a couple of the Altrix designer licenses in order to solve some tactical issues that they may be experiencing. Um, that, but it can quickly grow and scale as more individuals become enabled and empowered to take advantage of the data and glean the insights that can lead to massive savings into the millions of dollars for a modest investment in both the time and effort it would take in order to get Altrix implemented within their environment. And finally, the point here is everybody shows, you know, the various logos that they're working with. Um, with Altrix, you're definitely in good company. We work with most of the major health plans and provider organizations across the country. And within the Altrix environment, one of the most powerful aspects of what we do as a company is we create a community of users across the country and across the globe. And our user community is one of the strongest in the industry. And we've seen uh, exceptional uh, experiences of our customers working together both with one another within user groups, they work together with the Altrix resources, and they work together with our Altrix partner community in order to achieve their success and do it in a manner that is quickly and efficient and cost friendly. And so with that, I'll hand it over to one of our customers, Nathan Patrick Taylor, to tell his story and his journey with Altrix. Nathan? Yeah, <clears throat> great. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And, and I, I can piggyback on that and say the, the Altrix, Altrix community is indeed, uh, it's one of the strongest communities of all the products we use. If you have a problem, uh, generally you will find the answer on the community or someone will answer it within just a few minutes, which is just outstanding. So so kudos to you guys on the on the development of that community. Yeah, so I'll jump in. Uh, as, as Dennis said, I'm Nathan Patrick Taylor, the Chief Information Officer at Symphony Care Network. I'll give you a little bit of a background on what Symphony Care Network is. Name is a, is, is a, a little bit nebulous there. So we are in the post-acute long-term care space. Traditionally, people think of us as a nursing home provider, but we tend to not use that word too much anymore. We're starting to change the way we deliver healthcare and the way it, way it looks. And I don't want to read too much about what we actually do and where we operate. I want to talk about what we sort of look like. Our facility is set up where people spend the night there. So this is an, an inpatient care facility. Typically, our, our residents, rather than calling them patients, our residents stay with us uh, between 4 and 11 days on the short side. And on the long-term stay, they could be there for more than 100 days. Uh, our rooms are set up uh, kind of like you would see a hotel room set up. So there's a bed, a sitting area, a TV. They can have visitors. Uh, we've also got bars built into our facilities. Uh, there's, this one happens to have a happy hour. There's a fireplace on the left side there. Uh, and a few of them have uh, movie theaters built into them. Uh, ones that we operate in Michigan have this 1950-style Main Street view to them where it's got a salon and a, a Sunday shop. Uh, and then there's this garage facade set up with, with old Chevy cars in there that's pretty neat as an entryway to their activity center. So it's, it's very much a community of folks that also have healthcare needs. Of course, they tend to be a little bit older. We're looking at the 65-plus uh, population there. So that gives you a little bit of background on what we do. Most of our patients come to us from hospitals after they've had orthopedic surgery, uh, cardiac surgery, and they need rehab. Um, in the case of assisted and independent living, they just need some, uh, some health care needs provided sporadically uh, throughout their stay. So that's a little bit about us. Four states, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, 34 facilities total, 4,000 beds and 5,000 employees. So that's, that's the background on Symphony. So let me jump into our analytics journey. And we started this with Alteryx going back to probably late 2016 is when we started uh, this journey. And it was just thrown at me as a, as a way for us to be able to pull data from all these disparate sources. 
And if you, you know, you operate in healthcare, you know, you're dealing with pharmacy data, radiology data, laboratory data. You have to look at diagnosis codes, um, billing information. So it runs the gamut from clinical all the way through to financial. And so when we stumbled across Alteryx, we had this really scenic outlook, this beautiful picture of what we thought it was going to be like. And at the time that I was putting these slides together, my son was reading a book called Flat Stanley. It was about the Australian outback. And um, I imagined myself kind of, if I was going to go to Australia and see the outback, I sort of have in my mind what that might be like, the kangaroos, and I'd, I have this really rosy picture. And that was kind of our journey. We thought, well, we, we'll put this in place. We'll build it. People will love it. It'll be awesome. And what it, what it really turned into for us was kind of a, a Mad Max situation where we we built it and um, people were kind of blown away by what Alteryx was capable of doing but we were we were going it alone this was sort of unseen territory not just at Symphony but in the healthcare market in general I think we, we were one of the few healthcare customers that was actually using the full analytic suite and using not just designer but the server and gallery and we were building predictive models um, so it felt felt very lonely to some extent, and people looked to us to lead the way. Uh, and there were benefits that came along with that, but that's that's really what the journey ended up uh, being. Um, of course, it got to a beautiful place by the end, but but that's sort of where we started. Now, why did we do this? We did have a bunch of pain points at the beginning, and I mentioned those disparate systems. It was really difficult to pull data from our pharmacy, from our laboratory, from radiology, uh, our medical record, and then also interact with our accounting system, uh, with our timekeeping system. All of those different data systems were really, really painful. And we got no love. There was no sympathy from our management team saying, I feel sorry that you have all these different systems. It was more, you, this is the problem you guys have to solve it. And so um, we spent quite a bit of time looking at how how long it took to actually build some of the models and, and data components that we were putting together. And it was weeks, if not months at times. And, you know, you get the email saying, why is this taking so long? Why is it taking so long? And we found out a lot of what we were doing was highly manual. Exports to Excel, to CSV files, lots of VLOOKUPs in Excel, uh, tons of functions that have all sorts of errors in them. And so nothing ever matched. Uh, there was no that one source of truth uh, across our organization. And that made it really, really difficult on any given day to match uh, numbers that you would see on a financial statement to numbers that you would see uh, in some of our reports. We also had no common data model. So for us, a uh, census number is big. It's basically an occupancy rate. And so we need to be able to produce that in a consistent way and have a, a common logic around how that is calculated and, and what it actually means. And there's a number of other instances where that happened with readmissions and quality metrics where it was very difficult to come up with a common model and, and what exactly a readmission is and how it's calculated. So it led to a lot of recreation of, of the wheel. It was recreating the same report over and over again, and it didn't always match, and it caused frustration uh, with our management team. So some of the other challenges that we ran into uh, is the the team was, the, the, the analytic projects were just piling up. We would get more and more and more, and uh, they basically said, this is the challenge, and, and you have to solve it. And, very much like Neil Patrick Harris, we accepted that challenge and moved on and said, I think Alteryx is the place we need to go to to solve it. It has all the components that we need. And so our first step was to take very complicated logic, like calculating a length of stay, for example, when a, when a resident enters the building and when they discharge, there's also a number of things that happen to them during their stay. They could go back to the hospital for a planned procedure. They could have an emergency if they spike a temperature or they come down with the flu, they have to go back. Uh, and then we need to re-index their stay. Uh, if they didn't come from an acute care hospital, if they came from home or from another skilled nursing facility, they don't count, so they get excluded. But we still want to be able to see them on the report that they were admitted. They just don't count in the overall computation of a readmission. So those are those are some of the very basic complex logic we had. There were things that were a lot more complicated than that. Uh, looking at like clinical length of stay versus financial length of stay versus what a research team uh, wants to look at. 
we're very lucky to be partnered with the University of Chicago uh, on several research studies, and their needs are a lot different than what our financial team needs and what our clinical team needs. We also get a number of ad hoc reports and analysis requests. Uh, when we work, we work with the labor unions here in Chicago, and they frequently ask for data around hours worked and payroll information, and that means we have to include the union folks but exclude the non-union folks, and there's things around tenure that we have to deal with. So, again, the common model and common logic around all of that becomes really important. And then, as you all know, in healthcare, we're, we're highly regulated. So we have Cook County in Chicago that we have to deal with. We have the state of Illinois Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin, and then the federal government on top of that. So there's, there's a lot of regulatory requirements that we, we have to jump through. And then this will be a no-brainer to all of you. It's, it's common sense, but, but it was really difficult to get the rest of our team to understand this. And it's the difference between an executive view of data and a line staff view of data. And although on the surface that makes sense, when we're building a report for our executive team, we're building it for 15 people. And it takes a ton of time to build just this one view. But when we're building it for line staff, we're building it for 500 people. Uh, and so the usability there, time time to product or time to, anal to analyze, is there's a trade-off. 15 people are going to use it, but they're really important people, whereas the 500 folks, also very important, but that's a larger group of people, and they have different needs. They want to see detail. They want to be able to drill down. They want to look at individual patients where the executive team does not, and that's where building out the logic and understanding your model becomes really important. We also made some huge changes. I'll talk about where we came from and where we ended up, but we put most of our data out in Power BI. Uh, we chose that because our clinical staff know how to use Power BI intuitively without heavy training. I have no problem with Tableau. I love Tableau too. It's just that our clinical team prefers how Power BI works. But we're still not able to kill PDFs and Excel files. I don't think we'll ever get away from that. There are still regulatory requirements and, and other issues around why PDF and, and Excel is needed, and Alteryx has no problem kicking out reports to PDF, Excel, and also to the Power BI service. Um, and I should mention it does, it can send files out to Tableau and Tableau server. So um, you have that if that's what you're using. So our journey, of course, it started with the analytics team. And I, I have to say our team is not huge. We're, we're talking about two, two full-time employees and then we have a half employee. So for uh, an organization that has 4,000 beds to really only have two and a half people doing this is, is pretty incredible that we're able to get so much done with such a small team. And of course, that credit goes to Alteryx for us to be able to, to look much bigger than, than we really are. But I have found that organizations our size tend to have teams that small. Uh, I was talking to somebody from Health South, which is quite a bit larger than us, and they only had, at the time I was talking to them, about five or six people on their team. It may have grown since then, but that's that's normal. And so don't feel bad if you have a smaller team. This is really what the tool is designed to do is, is make it appear like you can have a huge analytics team with such a, such a small group. Um, and then the other team that we, that we brought along with us was the accounting team. And, and the reason I have this abacus on there is because they were doing everything in Excel, uh, straight Excel. All their analytics was done in there. All their formulas were in Excel. And they were actually begging for a new tool. They needed something that could pull in and it, 29 Excel files, one for every single one of our buildings, jumble it all together and spit out a report when it's done or do some sort of reconciliation. And again, Alteryx is really good at uh, amalgamating or aggregating all of that data together. Um, and so they, they really took this on. What's fascinating, even more than our analytics team, I had some folks that were that were a little bit against using Alteryx. They still want to do, to do traditional SQL and write code. Um, they finally got on board, but the accounting team jumped in really quickly. And I think it had to do with the fact that they were just so fed up with what they were doing in Excel. Uh, so we, we had this sort of vision. I, I like this Field of Dreams reference. I'm, have, since I'm in Chicago, I'm a White Sox fan. So um, I always I like to throw this in there that they, we had this idea that if we built it, people will come, and it sort of did happen to some extent. There, there were some users that used the output of what we generated, 
Uh, our HR team was a huge consumer of Alteryx content. But then we had others who just didn't want to jump on board. And, and so you're going to have that mix of people who will love the platform and who will adopt it, and then you'll have folks that you still need to train and, and sort of drag them along or convince them to use it. And that certainly happened in our case. It's definitely not a build and everybody's just going to jump on board. You still have to do the work to get them to get them trained and get them to start interacting with the platform. So let me talk about where we came from, just to give you an idea. If you're, if you're in the situation we were in, uh, how this could work for you. So we were very heavy Microsoft SQL Server. So we used integration services for all our ETL. We used reporting services to create those standardized paginated reports. Uh, and then we also had several dozen crystal reports sitting out there, old SAP business objects reports that had some very complicated logic in them. And that's why they were, they were very hard to get rid of because that logic was sitting inside that report, but it caused its own problem because we couldn't take the logic out of it and put it into a system that was a, a common logic source for us. And then we started to get into once tablets and iPhones became uh, very prevalent in, in healthcare and our line staff were using them. Uh, we started to develop reports and mobile report publisher uh, as well. So we had, you see, lots of different systems doing different things and there's logic all over the place. Uh, and so what we did was we got the Alteryx designer, just Alteryx designer, not the server, uh, for about three or four people. And they, they started converting over those old reporting services reports, the old crystal reports. What we click, quickly found out, though, is that we needed the scheduler. And there is an add-on to designer where you can schedule the job that you're creating, the workflow, to be run every hour or once a day or however often you want it to be run. The thing is, you probably are going to move very quickly off your local computer onto a server. And so as soon as we started scheduling, we didn't want to leave our computer on 24-7, so we started to move that to uh, an actual server. And uh, that's when it became, at that point, I call it the true self-service analytics. So we would build, as designers, workflows, and then the users would come into the gallery, the server, and they would choose what they would want. Like, they want to see readmission rates. They want to see what the census looks like, whatever they could run it on their own. At the same time, because we could schedule, we could push that data out to them and send it to them in an email or a scheduled, a scheduled job. And there's always going to be this push versus pull debate. Our clinical team is very much push. We push everything out to them. Think about doctors and nurses working the floor. They don't have time to log into another platform and run a report. So they very much like it when we push reports out to their inbox via email. The other teams that work in the business office, like HR, I, I mentioned, and accounting, they're fine going to the gallery and treating it as, as self-service. And a lot of the accountants are using Alteryx Designer, and they're building their own workflows uh, at their desk. So that's when we started to get that, that true self-service uh, aspect going. Where we ended up, so at the bottom, Panoply, which is basically Redshift, uh, has been our, I'll call it our massively parallel data warehouse. It's an incredible, it's a beast. It's a workhorse. Uh, that's what we moved to, so we got off SQL Server. Uh, we moved all of our crystal reports and mobile reports to Power BI, and then for uh, ad hoc requests and self-service, we're using Alteryx Server uh, Designer in the gallery. Okay, so <laughs> what did we learn from this journey? Uh, we, we celebrate our victories, so definitely we took time uh, to keep our entire executive team updated on what we were building. Um, and we, so we took moments where we, we had these sort of victory laps, but at the same time, we realized, you know, when is done, done? When is it finally over and it's never over? And so you, you have to sort of keep running the race even when you think you're, you're at the end. Um, just because you build it doesn't necessarily mean they'll come, and, and you've probably experienced this where you've had a user say, I need this report and I need it tomorrow, and you build it for them, and then they never use it. So we, we very much stay on top of utilization. So we run all our ultra util, utilization reports. We look at what we've built and what actually gets used. And we go back to the user and we hold them accountable. If they said they wanted it built and they're not using it, we ask why. And usually it's because there's something missing that they didn't ask for and we have to go back and add that particular feature and, and uh, get them to use it. 
um, we had way more use cases than we thought. And originally, we had planned on five or six use cases that we, we sold our executive team on. We calculated the ROI for them. But then once people saw what Alteryx was capable of doing, they came back to us with dozens of use cases. And we, even today, we still have a backlog of what we need to, what we need to put out, which is, which is a good thing. People are finally catching on to what Alteryx can do. And, uh, and that will keep growing, so I don't see that going away. Um, and then I throw this last comment there in there, everyone is an analyst. It sort of reminds me of the movie Ratatouille, where um, I think the, the chef in the very beginning of that says, uh, everyone can cook, right? Um, and so everyone can be an analyst. It's just a matter of whether they want to. And I'm, we're starting to see this this bleed over into the executive team even where they're very interested in treating Alteryx like we used to treat Excel, where you open it up and you can perform analytics like you did in Excel, but you're doing it in Alteryx. And it's fascinating to see that kind of growth, um, and which leads me into the last bullet point, the personal growth piece. We, on a, on a just side note, we're able to save some positions, some jobs, some people that we really liked, very talented people who wanted to leave because they were bored. They did not want to work in Excel anymore. We weren't really giving them an opportunity to grow, and Alteryx gave them that, that path. I'm, I'm thinking of two people in particular who uh, were able to take advantage of it and shared with me that they were bored. <laughs> so so that, that worked out really well uh, and benefited us uh, to do that, and that was sort of a, you know, a, a side benefit there. So when we talk about specific use cases, I'm not going to go through every single one of these. I've, I've picked out four or five that I think you all will be interested in, but just to run down the different departments. Clinical, we're very much census-driven. I call that our OMTM. It's our one metric that matters. If you read Lean Analytics by Kroll and Yoskovitz, it's a great book, and they talk about the one metric that matters in there, and for us, it's census. It's front and center. Everybody gets the census number every day. It's delivered to their email inbox at uh, 10.30 a.m. every morning, and they know what that number is. And that, that drives everything we do. It's so whether we, we make money or lose money, um, whether it drives our staffing levels, all of that. So that's, that's first and foremost. And then we have readmissions. We, we not just report on it, but we also categorize risk and we try and predict who will likely readmit. We also have length of stay. And then our, our census is tied to the PPD, which is uh, how much money a patient brings in per day. Uh, and so that's all on the clinical side. A little bit overlap with some of the financial we were horrible at being able to produce AR aging reports. Uh, we're, we're looking at millions and millions of transactions. And, uh, you know, when you're accounting for every single thing that you do, healthcare-wise, it generates lots of transactions. And those used to take uh, several days to run and create, and now uh, they run on a schedule and they're always available. Uh, labor and payroll, HR and turnover, those are all those are all um, things we weren't able to do before, especially turnover. And I'll, I'll tie that into COVID, and we'll talk probably a little bit about COVID in the Q&A. We lost a lot of staff that just didn't want to didn't want to come in. And uh, so being able to have those turnover numbers already um, were really important to us. Uh, last two things I'll mention, uh, operations. We On the previous slide, I mentioned clinical and financial. We started moving into operations and regulatory after we knocked those first two groups out. Uh, and operations seems seems kind of strange, but we're in my role, I'm looking at are people using their licensing? Are they logging in appropriately? Um, do we do we utilize Teams and Zoom correctly? We should have one, not both. Uh, are we spending money on on stuff we're not using? So I'm constantly looking at utilization in our integrations and make sure if we're paying tens of thousand dollars a month for an integration, are we actually using it? And that's that's uh, something we developed that was not part of our original use case plan. Uh, and then lots of regulatory things. We have to submit our payroll um, to the to the government. We have to do CMS submissions. COVID-19 created a lot of different uh, different data and reports that we had to track, not just positive tests, but also vaccines. And then we, uh, we have to submit data to the Office of the Inspector General, and I have an example of that coming up. In fact, it's the next one. Uh, so I, I don't like to do too many screenshots of Alteryx because um, 
a buddy of mine said, well, they all look the same anyway. So I don't, I don't like to, well, that's not entirely true, but I don't like to put too much in there because it gets into the weeds and the details of it. But I, I like this one specifically because on the top left, what we're doing is we're asking the user to submit a vendor file. So it's a, it's a file of all the vendors that the OIG, the Office of the Inspector General says, um, have violated uh, either RICO statutes or their known, their known entities for collecting dollars for terrorist organizations, whatever it is, they're an excluded, they're an excluded vendor. Uh, and they're not going to be reimbursed. So we, there's no direct connection to that data. The user does have to grab that from the OIG website. But once they have the file, when they run the Alteryx workflow, it asks them in a file browser, what's the file? And they drag and drop the file on there. And then we go out to our, our uh, accounting system and our medical record, and we pull all the vendors we use. And then it compares the list of vendors from the OIG to the vendors that we use and then says, these vendors, hopefully the list is very small, are on the excluded list and are likely not going to be paid or reimbursed. Uh, this was, this is supposed to be done every month. Um, previously, it took us three to four weeks just to do this. So it, it was right up against the deadline of when it needed to be done when this was manual. So that the manual, just to give you an idea, someone has to look at all 30,000 vendors we have and compare that to the OIG list of roughly, I don't know, it's about 1,800 vendors, and eyeball it. Just say, is, is this the same vendor? Does the name look the same? And so we're using an Alteryx, a fuzzy matching tool, to give a percentage of how close that name matches. And at the end, it's a high probability they can just, they can just say that's the, that's the right vendor. If the probability is low, they're just going to check and make sure it's correct and then, and then move on. Uh, so... In the end, this, this whole process, um, we're looking at uh, about, I'd say minimize the, the boring part of it, but it's about a 12-hour process. The person doing it was about $31.25 an hour, so it's, it's $375. And we do this a month. Once a month, we're looking at about $4,500. Now, we have to do this across all 28 locations at that time. We've grown a little bit since then, so we're looking at an annualized savings of about 126 k a year. So, I mean, that alone is, is a great ROI there on that one project. I think altogether it took us maybe three days to build the entire workflow start to finish. Um, on the licensing side, this is sort of an operations workflow where I'm going out to our Kronos database, and then I'm also pulling Active Directory uh, data from Microsoft. And I'm saying which employees have been terminated and are no longer here, but still have an active license, meaning the, the person who was supposed to tell us that that individual no longer works here or left failed to tell us. Um, and a lot of people think they have a clean process around it. You, you probably don't. There are people who fall through the cracks. We extract that information and then compare the licenses and spit this report out at the end of every month. And then once we have and know who that person is on the far right, we go and we uh, move into Active Directory and remo remove that license uh, from those individuals. Uh, this one, we never did this before. We, this was all very much manual um, if we even got around to doing it. So uh, some on average, E1, E3, E5 licenses will run you basically $9 a month. Uh, in this one step, we found 430 licenses that, were, that should not have been applied to that user. The other thing that this does is it tells you if the person is over-licensed, meaning they have an E5, which is a, a, it gives you every single thing Microsoft makes, and uh, they should really have an E1 or an E2. So it's based on their job code. Uh, and so we, re we downgrade them to a different license. So about $38.70 a month or $46,000 a year um, on that one. We also did this exact same workflow for our Zoom licenses when we moved to Microsoft Teams. And then another one around um, billing for telehealth data. So when we started to do telehealth in our buildings uh, right when COVID started, there really wasn't a mechanism in our medical record uh, to be able to capture what a telehealth visit was and, and flag it for billing purposes. And so we went into, we went into our medical record and then into our, our MDS, which was really just a data collection of assessments, and compared the two, the two groups. So who, who had the words telehealth or telemedicine in their progress note or in their visit, um, but 
but needed to have it on their bill. And so it puts those two things together, combines them, and then puts out a, a report at the end that goes directly to our billing team. So this generates every single day uh, for every building. And then they go in and they make sure that that telehealth visit was actually, was actually billed for that resident. Now I mentioned Power BI. So what, what this does, this workflow does, is it kicks out the data to Power BI. It won't be a shock that most of our telehealth visits, about 3,000 of them happened right after the shutdown and then it started to scale down. From there, we're still doing roughly 1,000 of them a month. Um, for protected health information purposes, I had to blur the screen. So nothing's wrong with your eyes. I just had to hide the patient names and, uh, and some of the other data, but they actually get the detail of, of the patient uh, and their payer, so they can go in and bill bill appropriately. And they can hover over an individual name and drill through and then look at the note. And the note will actually have what happened during that particular telehealth visit. So they can confirm it was indeed a telehealth visit uh, because there will be some false positives here where the word telehealth will show up if it says something like, I recommend this patient has a telehealth visit, but they didn't actually have one. Uh, so they go in, they validate that. Uh, so this one, this was a labor intensive process. They basically just had to pull a patient roster and look at every single patient's visits. Uh, so we estimated that that was about $67,500 to do that. Um, where net billings for this was three quarters of a million, a million dollars. So to be able to kind of automate that process and, and reduce the cost and make this a little less labor intensive, there still is some labor in there and having to review review the notes, uh, but it's it's much more streamlined. And then the granddaddy of them all, I, I call this sort of the boot camp analytics problem, our readmissions uh, workflow. I intentionally left this workflow ugly. This is not the way that I would normally leave it, but I just want to show you, I had to show it at a large level. All of the orange icons in the middle are reports. So this is generating a number, basically four or five different reports in each stream at the end. So we can look at who's readmitted and who hasn't, who potentially could readmit, it's a prediction, what their risk is, and then who hasn't readmitted yet, but if they did, would be within the 30-day penalty window. So all of that is in is in an individual report that they get once it's all been aggregated together. Um, so this is kind of a beast of report. It's not the worst workflow I've seen, uh, but there's a lot going on here. It still runs very quickly and is able to be produced uh, on a daily basis. And then I wanted to show you what it looks like when it comes out. So we, we provide the facility name. Again, I had to hide some of the health information that's in there. Uh, but we calculate how many readmits there were, what their comorbidity index was, so how, how complicated of a patient it was. We'll color code it if it's above a certain threshold. Um, and then what their length of stay was. And we're looking at folks that are there less than 30 days. Uh, it also comes out, this is the really neat thing. So this particular analytic process goes to Power BI, but it also kicks out an Excel spreadsheet at the same time. So what we get a lot of requests are is they want the report and then they want to be able to do some further exploratory analysis in Excel, which is totally fine. It runs at the same time and, and kicks out both sets. So they, they have the ability to look in Power BI and do it within Excel. Um, so again, this is we when we did the analysis on this about twenty four thousand dollars annually to be able to produce this report. Uh, we also looked at how much this reduced readmissions by getting this data in front of people. So we did kind of a pre test, post test to say how what did our readmissions look like before and what did it look like after we instituted this risk analysis and predictive model, and we came out with about three hundred ninety two thousand annually. Um, last one before I get on to the questions, because um, I'm sure there'll be some around what we did with COVID. Um, and we were just in a really good place, thankfully, with, with Alteryx set up, with Panoply, Power BI, all of these things aligned. I think from day one, we had a, a tracking mechanism put in place, uh, and we were able to track both positive patients and positive staff. The tracking staff was a, a really important thing. Um, and I think those two those two requests came one day after each other. So someone asked, can you track positive patients? And then the next day, can you track positive staff? And re the reality is it was e as easy as switching the data source over on the left, saying for patients, I'm going to our medical record and for staff, I'm going to Kronos, our, our timekeeping system uh, to pull some of that information. And then 
as dirty as it sounds, to capture some of this information, we just made SharePoint lists. And because there was no mechanism to capture COVID-19 tracking, there wasn't even an ICD-10 code at the very beginning. So we spun that up really quickly. Um, it's all secure within our network. And then Alteryx just goes out to those SharePoint lists for each site and pulls the data in uh, every, I think it runs every two hours. So we, we have fairly up-to-date counts on where positive patients and positive staff are. Uh, and then we did the same thing for vaccine tracking. Um, this was sort of unmeasurable before because it, it sort of never, never existed. And I, we couldn't really measure this in dollars. It's really hard to say what the impact was. The, the thing is, we made it through last year. Um, it was like a lot of our competitors were closing and, um, you know, we're, we're still in business. So I consider that a win, even if we can't measure the actual dollar amount. Um, we were quickly able to control the spread of the virus in, in a number of our buildings where we had outbreaks. And we made one really, really smart decision very early on in one of our buildings, and we wouldn't have been able to do that if we didn't know what the outbreak looked like. Uh, and so a lot of the folks internally attribute that to, to some of the reporting we were able to do. So to sum it up, um, in all the projects we were looking at about our, our renew, our revenue recovery was about 5.5 million. Um, we had an 800% increase in productivity. I just measure that based on how, how many analytic products we produced before to now. Uh, 35 or more users have adopted our platform since we started, and um, we've produced about 75 additional data products. And total savings on our, on our staffing and payroll side have been about $1.3 million. So that kind of sums it all up. I'll do quickly the roadmap. Where are we going to go from here? So we're looking at RPA and robotic process automation, and we consider analytic process automation, those two things to sort of flow together. Uh, we, we love Power BI, but we're never done looking. So, you know, we're going to look at Click and Looker, too. Maybe there's something better for us to do there. We're reinventing our data warehouse. It'll be our third iteration of our data warehouse in six years, uh, which is which is a beast to go through. <laughs> but we really consider Alteryx to be that kind of rapid application development platform because it, it can take user feedback and the interface tools allow, you, allow the user to respond. So um, that's a really nice built-in feature. We're also looking at moving beyond HL7 and going straight APIs. And so we have two massive API projects with our food and dietary and our durable medical equipment vendor uh, that is outside of HL7 and Fire. It's just straight API usage. And we're doing the same thing with our wound, um, wound company uh, as well. And like I said, I really think Alteryx is heading into a space where, where Excel was. And, and you're going to start seeing more people use it the way that they used to use Excel in a much, much more common way. And I, I can see that sort of happening. So I'll leave it there. And now um, I'll move on to questions. Wonderful. Well, Nathan and Dennis, thank you both so much. This has been such an informative, entertaining presentation, so we really appreciate it. Like Nathan said, we'll now begin today's question and answer session. If you have any questions for Nathan or Dennis, please submit them now by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your webinar console. Um, we've already had a lot of great questions rolling in. The first is, do these reports auto-generate in the system, or does this require us to collaborate and build the required report? Yeah, I can, I can take a stab at it, Dennis, and if you want, if you don't mind. And sure. so there's, I'll say the, the main concept around Alteryx is that, um, so you're going to build the workflow that generates the report and the data, but I don't want to, I don't want to short sell Alteryx. Um, there is an auto generation capability in that once once that initial workflow has been built, uh, it can be very dynamic. Meaning you can schedule it to create those reports and to create those those data outputs uh, based on settings that you you set up. And so we give we give users a lot of options. You think of them as like drop down lists or filters, um, but you can make it spin through all of the options that are available. And we do that for. Our, all 34 of our locations, some folks only need to see one location and some folks need to see all 34 together if it's our executive team. So I guess it's a both and answer to that question. You have to build the workflow to produce the, the analytic result. Uh, but once it's been built, you're, you're scheduling in it and we'll start to produce it automatically at that point. Got it, thank you for clarifying yeah. that. 
the next question is, have you done any validation of predictions? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so without getting too, too in the weeds on, on the data science portion of it, um, so one of the things we really liked about Alteryx is it, it has an integration to our, our, um, our data science platform. And I don't want to step in on any toes there. Alteryx has, has some great data science tools built into it on the R and Python side, and it's also got its own uh, custom-made built-in tools. Uh, but we use an external company to do that, and there is an integration with it. And uh, there, we go through the, the typical data science process. So we have a you know, training set, a test set. We produce the model. And then once we've created the predictions, we store the predictions in, um, I'll call it a temporal table. It basically says, this is what the model predicted was going to happen to the patient. And after 30 days go past, we pull the prediction up, and then we say, what did the predicted look to the actual and how accurate was it? Uh, and so we've we've seen about 78 to 79% accuracy. That's just straight. When it said that it was going to be admission, readmission, was it really a readmission? And, it, and there's different things in the data science realm you can do to weight those, but that's, that's the baseline metric. 78% doesn't sound great, but when you're talking about a readmission problem, uh, that's actually very good. It's a it's a it's a really strong uh, model, and so yes, we go back and we validate those, and and we see um, how well the model performs. I'll make one more comment in on it. The other thing that happens is you'll have data drift. So as we bring on new facilities, as we start to open up new clinical programs, the the underlying assumptions that the model used to calculate or to build the prediction may change. Um, we, we've had a large influx of a very specific demographic in Chicago recently, and that has caused the model to drift. Uh, so we get an alert, we get flagged on it, we go back, we rebuild the model, and then put it into production. So yeah, it's a it's one of those things where you're never done. It's a constant monitoring process. That makes sense. Thanks for outlining that validation process. Another audience member is asking, how can RPA integrate with the APA? Yeah, and, and uh, Dennis, I'll I'll give my answer, and then I know I know you probably have an answer on that. <laughs> um, I'll say so. We use UiPath, um, and there is an integration, a set of um, I think that it's it's the starter pack or the integration pack, uh, where you can trigger an RPA process off of what a, a workflow generates or does. Um, we are in the very early stages of building that out, and we have a. I'll call it a prototype, but we have not put one into production yet, but I know it is a capability of, of uh, what UiPath does with Alteryx. So that's my answer on it. I'll leave it to you, Dennis. It, no, thanks, Nathan, and that's perfect. You know, Alteryx works together with the RPA vendors out there like UiPath, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, you know, whatever your, your choice is, and we've got uh, connectors built into those applications, and, and it's just like you described. So. All tricks says the, the analytics uh, process automation component can take the RPA activity as an input. And as that RPA activity comes in through all tricks, it can be triggering processes. It could be flagging communications. Um, it could be, you know, triggering an event that then uh, all tricks will kick off its own workflows and processes, uh, provide results. It could be predictors. It could be, you know, again, additional communications. It could be sending more information upstream. And what I really like, Nathan, is what you showed earlier in the fact that the output isn't single-threaded. The output may produce some reports and it may produce some consumable assets, but it also, at the same time, may be triggering another event within the RPA process that would actually um, take on some additional activities further upstream. So uh, the APA yeah. platform with Alteryx is very much engaged with the RPA strategy within the organization. Yep. yep. Wonderful. Thank you both for weighing in on that one. Dennis, let me stick with you for this next question. Uh, the audience member is asking, how long does it typically take healthcare providers to experience value from Alteryx? Um, and are there any best practices for adoption that we can learn from? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's an area where Alteryx has really been very successful with our customers. Um, the time to value is extremely quick, whereas in a typical IT implementation or new software implementation, you start to look at it as 
months and months of, of implementation time, maybe large IT engagements in order to be able to make this all happen. The reality is when implementing Altrix, and, you know, keep me honest here, Nathan, um, you know, when an individual sits down with Altrix, there is a massive amount of online community support. Uh, there's a significant amount of online help. And the tool itself is very intuitive to the analyst level user, to someone who's used to working with the data that doesn't have to be highly technical. So someone sitting down with Altrix for the first time could start to become productive within just a matter of days and really become efficient within the tool set uh, within a matter of weeks. And so you know, the ramp time in order to start churning out value is typically within the first few weeks of actually working with the product. And it's actually the way that we often engage with our customers where we'll put the product into their hands, work through enablement with them or with a partner and get them up and running. And so the time to value can be just a matter of weeks at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I, my goal with some of this is to actually get the IT folks to keep their hands off of it. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want them to, um, prohibit or be you know be the 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 necessary necessarily the gatekeeper or stop the analysts from being productive i think that's that's kind of the mental shift that people need to make as these tools are coming online is um i think traditional companies think of them as like well everything that's data and reports is if it if it's if it's computer oriented i it's it's domain and we had to break people of that concept and say you know we really want some of the IT folks' hands off of this and put it into the hands of the actual people doing the work. Um, and that, that was, thankfully for us, it was well-received. I've heard other organizations, of course, it's been a challenge, but um, we were able to do that pretty successfully. Wonderful. And Nathan, looks like this next question is geared toward you. The question is, have you seen a change in culture with the deployment of self-service analytics with Altrex and Power BI? Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a this great actually two really great people that um when we acquired there's a there's a lot of merger and acquisition that goes on in, in our niche of healthcare. We we acquired a set of facilities and one buildings, one one person was a secretary for the VP of operations. And um she was actually tasked with doing a lot of data maintenance and upkeep and, and tracking. And so I said, you know, we have, we have an Alteryx license. You've probably never heard of it, but I'll, I'll give you a quick demo. And I spent 45 minutes with her and just showed her how to use it. And I, I think her comment was like, well, this is kind of like Excel on steroids. I can just do all this, this manipulation pretty quickly. And so I have somebody who's not an analyst, you know, no IT background, not a programmer at all. And, and adopted it and, and brought it on. And now she's, she's producing lots of analytics content and, and just not that traditional kind of analytic developer at all. And we have two people who fit into that category. Um, so my, why I say that is you sort of have to keep your mind open to who can do it. Um, uh, so I make that Ratatouille reference, like anybody can do it as long as they want to. And that's the, the, the will versus the skill. Um, do they skill is one thing, but do they even want to do it? And um, so we've opened kind of opened the floodgates and say, hey, if you want to dive in, uh, we have the license, we'll get it for you and, and you can use it. Now, of course, what comes with that is we monitor their usage to make sure they're actually publishing content on the gallery and, and it's useful. Um, but that, yeah, that has happened quite a bit. And, it, and we've also got this culture where we've said, we can no longer function in a world where we're dealing with faxes and paper um, all the time. Like we, we literally had people printing stuff out on a printer still and then scanning it so they could get it in, in a digital format. And we, we took a lot of that away from them and kind of forced them into this digital world. As scary as that sounds about healthcare, that's sometimes where we are, <laughs> where they're, they're still doing things in a very old way and they don't want to change. And we've just made that a, a cultural shift. Um, and you'll have some people that'll lag and some people that'll come on board, but for the most part, that has helped us move into that digital space. 
Wonderful. Thanks for sharing your experience with that. I feel like it's very helpful for our audience to hear. Um, and it looks like we have time for about one more question, um, which touches more on COVID-19, which I know you spoke a little bit about towards the end of the presentation, Nathan. The question is, mm -hmm. how did Alltrex help you pivot and respond to the pandemic? And what were some of the key lessons you learned? Yeah, I'd say I'd say the the big pivot for us was the importance of being nimble, agile, and flexible, and everything. Um, which we had we lined up what we were building in Alteryx so well, and and had very complex logic built in that common data model. And then when COVID happened, it was um, I need to generate this port report in 15 minutes because I'm going to be on WGN News or CBS News with a reporter. <laughs> and they want to talk about this building, and I need specific details. So, uh, you know, in our old system, we that would have been no way. That's not happening. Um, and now we were able to generate that really quickly. I'd say the other, probably the most fascinating thing that came out of this is we we generally don't share information publicly. Uh, freely. It usually has to come from some sort of regulatory requirement. For better or worse, that's how we are in healthcare. But we spun up a web page that has our COVID-19 numbers on it. Um, and that report, if you saw it, comes straight out of Alteryx. So we basically, the, the output drops it onto our website and it gets published there every morning. Um, and we had never done that before. That was scary for us. We were like, Usually we at least vet a report before it goes out to the public. Um, and you're telling me you want Alteryx to just drop something on our website every day. And they said, yes, that's what we want it to do. So um, that was a first for us. Uh, and again, something that we, we probably wouldn't have been able to do without the tool. So yeah, the, a lot of, there were a lot of interesting stories that came out of that experience. And appreciate you sharing some of them as well. So that is all the time we have left for today. Um, Nathan and Dennis, thank you again, truly, for such a great presentation. And I'd also like to thank Alltrex for sponsoring today's webinar. To our audience member, if you'd like to learn more about the content presented today, please be sure to check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post-webinar survey. Otherwise, thank you again for joining us, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care.